Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? A big hug from the E2KG network on YouTube. My name is Gasly Stamos from GearWorks.com, and I am back here with you this evening to do our quick rundown, E2KG in 30, which is the uh, new show for our uh, titular channel. And our objective is to get you in and out of here in 30 minutes or less, um, covering the latest and some of the biggest news in the gaming industry for the past week. Here with me, not as always, because we kind of have a rotation going on, but here with me, I'd say 66% of the time, uh, as always, is Swiss Guard. How you doing, Swiss? Good. I'm, uh, I think I'm coming down with a cold, so tonight's yeah. E2KG is brought to you by Halls. Uh, <laughs> they're enough to keep me going. I'm going to power through. <laughs> nice, nice. I'll make a quick microphone. What I hope it's a quick microphone adjustment here. Sorry, that's just the thing I didn't catch before we went live, but it'll be okay. I thought it would be okay, and I thought it would be quick. Okay, so sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, so uh, Swiss is going to take you through a bit of a summary of what we discussed uh, earlier this week on Monday on the flagship show of the network, Enough to Keep Going, uh, while I get the social media out. So Swiss Guard, go ahead and take it away. So we had a pretty good conversation on Monday um, about the freemium model. And initially, everyone, you know, you might say free is good, right? I like free things. But uh, I, I'd say E2KG seemed to, to generally agree that not so fast. Uh, we had a good discussion on whether they're a good thing for the industry and whether that financial model is maybe the future of the games industry. But um, we came to some... Uh, some interesting conclusions, the first of which is games should not be free. And uh, from a consumer perspective, sounds kind of backwards, but ultimately games are inherently not free to make. It costs money to develop them. You gotta pay developers, artists, publishers. The marketing budgets in games is uh, probably far higher than most actually think. Um, so, somebody's got to recoup those costs. So games cost money to make. We, the consumer, have to pay them. So as far as how this affects us from a play style perspective, we, we kind of discussed some of the, um, the challenges that this freemium model brought up. So when you have a freemium model that says, hey, you need to buy this next piece if you want to keep going. Otherwise, you have to wait a few hours. You know, you got to, you got to, a break in the rhythm. So we discussed how the rhythm of games, if you know the game interrupts you every 10 minutes or an hour or so to beg for cash to increase their revenue, uh, you know, is that good for the player? Um, ultimately, I you know, I don't think that's a very great thing for the experience. It kind of shatters that uh, suspension of disbelief when you get absorbed in it and um, integrated in a game. We um, we also talked about, a little bit about how those interruptions uh, or those those <laughs> begs for cash could uh, could take different forms. It doesn't have to be a stop. You can't play until you pay. They could be just cause like in at purchases uh, loot boxes, if you will. So we kind of talked a little bit about cosmetics versus uh, purchasing to win the game. And you know, when you get games that say, "Hey, if you pay, you can win." That's kind of a sleazy carrot, I would say. And um, I almost think that's kind of tempting for both the developer and the player because in the player's perspective, hey, you know, I just I just want to get good. I just want to continue. I just want to achieve my goals. Uh, what's another 50 cents? What's another 99 cents? And for the for the developer, you know, putting these paywalls up, it, it's very easy to to to, to insert that carrot. Um, but ultimately, is it good for the gameplay experience? Finally, uh, we, we talked a little bit about Shadow of War. That, that was one of the impetuses for the, for the discussion, how they're using random loot boxes, which, okay, so loot box, not so bad. We, we talked a little bit about how you know games are more expensive to develop now. Prices stayed pretty static over the years, and this is a way they can increase the revenue stream. But they're using random loot boxes, and uh, 
that we kind of felt was a little bit sleazy. It's almost like you're having to purchase lottery tickets in your game. So, you know, oh man, I, I want to get that sweet uh, new sword, but I got the same thing that I got the last three times. You're making the player pay multiple times for one item and it, it just doesn't pass the smell test. So um, in the post show, we were kind of talking about how there were so many avenues we could go down as far as what would be a you know, just revenue in the games industry and, and, and the financing of, of game development. Um, we tried to focus on the freemium model, and I think this is fertile ground for many future discussions. But um, ultimately, uh, I think we had a great conversation, and you know, free is uh, f free is not such a good thing sometimes. Um, when you pay and you're you're committing to something, um, it shows the developer support, and it uh, I think it 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 demands uh, some professionalism from the developer. So I kind of like the current model that we have, but uh, you're free to uh, disagree and we'd love to hear your comments and please check out the show. E2KG is episode eight, games should not be free. All right, thanks a lot, Swiss. So all the social media is out, everybody's alerted to the live stream and we will go ahead and get straight into our rundown tonight. So as always, I put all of the cast members' submitted stories into the randomizer, and as it turns out, in a strange quirk, I have the top three leading off the hit list. So I, I don't know one... how random the randomizer. <laughs> but so, uh, so the first story comes from Games Radar, uh, entitled "The Xbox One Dashboard is Getting a Big Redesign Again." Come familiarize yourself. So the Xbox Dashboard, I. I think in my mind, uh, this will be the third, uh, uh, third, uh, it, I'm missing my word. I keep wanting to say in iteration um, of, uh, of the Xbox One operating system uh, main landing page since I've been an owner that I can remember. Uh, the first one was the uh, infinite, infinite horizontal scroll is what I refer to that design as um, because uh, just everything couldn't fit on your main screen. So you would just scroll to the right forever. Um, and, and things were, it wasn't a good design in my opinion. Things weren't centralized. Uh, you, you would often go all the way over to the right hand side to, to get something that um, I felt should have been right on the main landing page. Um, I, I can't really tell. So there's a video posted in this article. Um, I haven't checked it out. Uh, I didn't realize it was a video. I thought it was just an image. Um, the, uh, let's see, the videos, uh, it's about six minutes. So but it's a little hard for me to tell exactly what's going on here, but it, it basically looks like um, you, you will, it, it almost seems like they're going back to the infinite horizontal scroll, uh, which like I said, I didn't care for. Uh, tiles are smaller on the main landing page. Uh, and as you come across a title, um, it looks like it uh, pops out into a uh, more granular uh, detailed selection ribbon bar beneath it. So it kind of looks a little actually like the PlayStation 4 home screen, just with the, row of, uh, I'll call them primary icons or tier one icons, um, move down uh, more so near the bottom of the screen. Whereas on the PlayStation 4, you know, that that, that infinite row of icons is, is kind of near the top. And then as you hit each one, stuff pops out below it. So uh, I'm not a fan of what I see right now. This, uh, I think this went live uh, earlier this week. Um, yeah, so it, uh, it became available for... Um, for testers on Monday. So if you're in the beta ring, you either have this already or you can access it. Um, and let us know what you think. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of what I see right now, but um, like I said, I've really never quite been satisfied with the dashboard. Um, you know, we, we, we rag and rail on the Kinect, which which I also have disconnected at this point, but it's unfortunate because the Kinect was a thing that, uh, that I could always use to interface with my console regardless of where they move things on the UI. So, um, now, Switch, you, you said so. You said you don't have an Xbox One. Um, do you have any? Do you have a PlayStation Four? Yes, I have the PS Four. Okay. So, and, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say I'm not a huge fan of the uh, the side scrolling uh, interface either. Um, I guess they kind of do the prioritization queue where the the latest is on the left, but right. uh, I, I don't know. I, I I prefer a hierarchy more than a than a uh, priority queue. So, uh, right. what 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 do you think is? Uh, I, I was surprised to see that it's been 
the third major redesign in the past two years. So I'm I'm curious as to uh, what you know Microsoft is uh, their strategy is with this. Is it? I'm not sure. the The long running belief was that the the, the plan and intention, what we were seeing, was a was an evolutionary design that was proceeding more towards unification with Windows 10. And there are Windows 10Z like elements uh, in the most recent design, uh, but it's still not the Windows 10 landing page. So I'm not quite certain what's going on uh, with where they're going next. Um, but but at the end of the day, the operating system is definitely has Windows 10 underpinning, so that feels safe and comfortable. Um, I, my objective is, look, I just want to scroll left and right less. And, and quite frankly, I would be just as happy if they did. There's a large emphasis on surfacing um, uh, inner data right on the landing page. And I'm kind of like, I don't really need that. Um, I don't need the live tile effect. Uh, just just give me icons that allow me to get into apps um, and, you know, quite frankly, put them all on the main landing page in folders and, and I'll be fine. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see exactly where this goes. So uh, the second story I have in my rundown is um, uh, over on PC Gamer. Actually, Razer launches white-gray versions of its most popular accessories. And I will go ahead and bring those up. So uh, this was um, uh, surfaced by a user on Twitter named uh, Minilad, uh, who apparently lives over in the UK, who maybe, maybe got wind of these devices or actually saw some of them. I'm not absolutely certain, but I will see if I can get the screen share out. So yeah, hopefully you guys can see that, but uh, that's his um, that's his tweet um, showing the uh, the devices that are in play. Um, I think Razer now has kind of just said, hey, yeah, that it's out. So on their homepage, you can actually uh, see the see see their official screenshots too okay all right excellent so um so the so the devices that are uh going with this i guess i'll call them paint scheme or mold scheme is the uh, black widow x chroma mechanical keyboard the kraken x1 gaming headset uh the lancet gaming mouse and the invicta dual surface mouse pad with aluminum base now i am an owner of uh of the kraken uh 7.1s. Uh, I actually haven't gotten around to testing them yet, um, but I have, a, I have a green pair. Um, I, I always like this color scheme being around, particularly uh, in a long-standing line of products that have historically only offered uh, black as a color. Um, I tend to go with uh, white uh, colored electronics if they are available, um, just because they tend to stand out from, you know, if, you know, across across all of my devices in the lab, right. Um, 90% of them are uh, are colored black because that was the only option uh, offered by the vendor. So whenever there's an option to get a, a white or any kind of differently colored electronic, I am definitely up for that. Um, so yeah, like you mentioned, this is a this is a nice thing to see just to create some variance in the line. I, I like that rather than going with like nine different colors, um, you know, or, or, or eight colors, you know, for across the primary colors. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that they just isolated it down to... Uh, to white, um, which is a kind of very Apple-esque approach, right? If if anybody remembers the years of the uh, of the plasticky um, but very thick and heavy 13-inch uh, MacBook, you know, there, there was the, there was the MacBook uh, uh, white and then the MacBook uh, pla uh, black plastic. So, um, and I I had a white one, but I really wanted uh, the black one, uh, which is kind of a strange juxtaposition. So, I um. I like them. Uh, I'm not sure so much about the Black Widow Chroma keyboard. I'm not like the the darker or the kind of the gray with the white keys kind of yeah. looks a little bit um, off to me. Well, it, and it feels and it feels a little like everything else. <laughs> like so many other manufacturers are using that color scheme that that's the one that actually feels like um, we've seen too much of already. But you know, it's Razor, so yeah. I I really like the mouse. The um, that that looks nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes me regret that I bought. I mean, I like that my Krakens, my Krakens are uh, are the bright green ones because um, that's kind of my color style. But uh, I regret that I didn't have the what the white colored option uh, when they launched. It'll it'll be interesting to see if uh, if this kind of goes into some of their other products because I kind of on my next upgrade, I'm kind of considering getting a laptop and then getting an external GPU. So the Razer Core is kind of 
on my uh, on my radar, and a white razor core would be, or in Mercury or whatever they're calling it, might be interesting. Great. Uh, and then the final uh, and the final article that I have in my rundown is uh, from the PlayStation blog. The drop a new PlayStation game, PlayStation games for this week. So these are games that would have just launched this past Tuesday. Um, the big uh, the big headliner title is. Um, Hellblade, so it was Sacrifice, uh, which came out this Tuesday. Um, as we've recently discussed, this is a game that is definitely not in my wheelhouse. Um, so, uh, so, but it's out there. I guess what would, what catches my eye more so is Lawbreakers, which of course I've uh, had a, a lot of time in um, having been playing since the alpha uh, and having done a, a site visit down at the Bosky Studios. Um, for the first alpha uh, uh, ever of the game. Um, now that it's out, I'm not, you know, super rushed to buy it just because I'm not in a rush to get back into um, a, uh, a first-person shooter arena kind of game out on the uh, uh, out in public spaces. Um, so I'll just kind of let that one simmer and see how it goes. Um, other titles of note: uh, Batman: The Telltale Series Season Two, uh, Episode One. Um, so this is the whole next season. Uh, the previous season haven't been haven't been wrapped up in what I believe was three episodes uh, earlier this year. Um, there's a lot of indie games that are out. Uh, I'm not going to go through any of them here. Uh, Lawbreakers, as I mentioned, uh, there's a Mega Man Legacy Collection two for uh, long time uh, fans of that franchise, and I think that is about it for games. Uh, of, of note in video, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is out. And that does it for me, Swiss. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. My first story is uh, for the PlayStation 4 firmware. So a few weeks uh, a few weeks ago, I think we mentioned that Sony was looking to have beta testers for the upcoming 5.0 major firmware release. And there was some speculation, uh, you know, they didn't. There wasn't any real information on what would be out there, uh, what would the release would entail. But um, Eurogamer has a, uh, released a copy of the release notes, and um, so with the release notes, uh, they they have the de the full details on the 5.0 firmware. the The big thing is it's going to add 1080p. Twitch streaming at 60 frames per second for PlayStation 4 Pro users. So here's another um, reason perhaps to buy a Pro even if you don't have a 4K television. Uh, they already can use a Pro for 1080p remote play and share play, the, the article notes. But now if you, if you stream on Twitch, you can get 60 frames per second full HD if you own a PS4 Pro. Um, another of note is the inclusion of family accounts. So um, personally, I, my older children are starting to get the age where uh, online play is becoming feasible. And so with uh, these new family accounts, you can have multiple parent and guardian roles, and then you can have sub child accounts tied to the PS4 and the parents can you know control um, communications and content and whatnot, limit privileges. And there will be a new web application to uh, manage those controls. So that's good. And then the, the final looks like thing that Eurogamer details uh, update is the uh, a change to your quick menu. So you don't need to go back to the home screen in order to check your uh, notifications. They'll be right from the quick menu. Um, there's some other tweaks to the quick menu and uh, there's a few other little things, but it, it appears that the, the big deal is the family accounts and the Twitch streaming. So PS4 Pro users, get out there and uh, share your content. That looks like what they want uh, to promote. Now, it's, so I don't know if PlayStation 4 has any kind of like a beta ring or anything like uh, Xbox One does. Um, did, did, it, did you see anything mentioned in the comments or anything about, uh, like, um, I guess my curiosity is whether or not that has any impact uh, on 
on your on your on your you know on onboard frame rate, right? So is the is the 1080p 60 uh, for for both the base PlayStation and the PlayStation 4? I mean, PlayStation I it, PlayStation 4 Pro. The um, the thrust of the article seemed to indicate that it was just for the PS4 Pro. So, okay. don't think. Yeah. That, I don't it think seems the like PS4 has enough horsepower. It seems like that increases the complexity of that layer that they have to do the live streaming, right? Because, because what's curious, because this is a thing that I run into on PC as I've added in 4K monitors, is 4K turns out to not be as important as some people will make it out to be because. You know, and one of the reasons why is because there are no video capture cards that capture at 4K, now, at least not consumer level. So I've got a 4K monitor, but if I am streaming or doing game capture, I have to back out and step that down to 1080 because that's all my capture cards can handle. So, um, so, so what this means is they've got to be doing something where they are able to stream the content at the at a resolution that's that's non-native uh, to the console, which I guess they've been doing all along because. Uh, um, most games are 1080 or 1080, but I think that that PlayStation 4 application has been streaming at like 720p, which is one of the reasons I haven't used it. Um, so I guess they've been doing that all the while. So maybe it's not that big of a difference. Yeah, I um, just you mentioned the comments. I just really quick glanced at them. They don't people don't seem to be you know rising from their seats in. Uh, <laughs> cheering the uh the changes but i don't think anybody's upset with them i think people are a little bit underwhelmed um when they when they said playstation 5.0 firmware coming you want to be a beta tester i think people expected more so it might just be a case of uh um un unwarranted hype yeah although i would encourage strongly encourage people to to, to calm down because <laughs> Let's, let us not forget the, the horrible years that we endured on the PlayStation 3 and how it managed updates and how they were far, far, far more frequent and way, way, way slower um, in downloading and applying them. But I'll let you go ahead with your next one. Sure. <laughs> um, my next one's a little bit um, of a smaller story, but it tickled my fancy. Dragon Quest Builders 2 was announced. And... Uh, I actually own Dragon Quest Builders on the PS4, um, but I haven't played it in any of the time windows for our uh, for our core show, so I haven't included it in my playlist. Um, but it's a it's a charming little game, and uh, my my son and I have a lot of fun playing it. So uh, they they've announced a sequel, and what really um, what really interested me beyond just hey, this is a game I like and they're coming out with another one, is um, the fact that they're releasing it for the PS4 and the Nintendo Switch. So the original Dragon Quest Builders was just was a PS4, PS3, and PS Vita. So it was kind of Sony exclusive. And this is another example of developers being very friendly to the Switch and another indication that the Switch is uh, on financial foundation, if you will. That's always been the knock on the Nintendo, right? Oh, they can't get the third parties. They can't get the third parties. And and the Switch seems to be attracting developers. So that was one I'm going to have to decide, you know, ultimately, if the game's reasonable, um, which, which platform to get it on. The other thing that I like to see about it is that it actually might include, or according to the article, I got this from GameSpot, it will have a multiplayer mode. So I, I think I don't I can't find the actual quote here, but I think it said uh, up to four players. Yeah, version of the game will support multiplayer for up to four players, which which should be cool. Yeah, um, and, and, they, and they really got to get more explicit about that copy t that ad, that ad text, right? Because that could be taken to mean a few different things, and I think the one key thing that that other people want to know is can you. Can you can you play that can you play it that way locally in co-op using the right. um, short distance uh, you know onboard generated Wi-Fi network that a switch can generate or um, is that only via uh, the internet backbone? I don't see yet uh, a release date either, so I'm not even. Sh it's probably next year, but um, 
so yeah, so there's still some questions, but seems like an interesting uh, direction that they might be taking. Um, we got a short night because there's just the two of us and it's still August, <laughs> so there's not that much news going on. But my final story is on Overwatch. So Blizzard has announced deathmatch mode for Overwatch. In full disclosure, I am not an Overwatch player. I have seen my brother-in-law play it, but I have not played it myself and I don't own it. But it kind of surprised me that it wasn't actually a mode already. So the game came out May of 2016, so it's over a year. And I kind of just assumed that something like Deathmatch would be kind of part of the core game experience. But uh, they've been focusing on um, you know the team, team aspects. So Deathmatch will come in two modes, death, uh, Team Deathmatch and Free For All. And uh, Team Deathmatch, you'll have two teams competing to get aggregate kills. And uh, Mercy, who I think is more like the healer, a healer class character, uh, can take kills away from the other team. Uh, free for all, everyone for themselves, get to 20 as fast as possible. They said some of the maps are being modified with this mode in mind. So that's, um, you know, an interesting thing. I, I'm curious how much of this was planned initially and how much of this was, you know, gamers that are used to having a deathmatch mode in first person shooters just kind of saying hey we, we'd like this and is this something that they kind of implemented at a later date uh one new map chateau gillard is uh being added specifically for deathmatch so and where is the release date it was announced today my article doesn't tell me when it's going to be released. It says they've just pushed the new modes to the testing servers. So it'll be added to arcade mode when released, but they don't really have a date for it. You, you Have you played Overwatch? Uh, I have sparingly. Uh, I have the game for the PlayStation 4. Um, I've, I've gotten on a couple times and, and had a good time every time I've played. It's just for whatever reason, it, it hasn't... Uh, Burble to the surface with me as far as something that I would, uh, you know, spend two or three hours in at a time. Um, I continue to allocate uh, the the response to that particular yen, or, or um, when, when I get it, is uh, has been destiny. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed Team Fortress too. So that was like you know when Overwatch came out, that was the big comparison. And uh, but lately, for me, the the most interesting thing about Overwatch has been the fact that they're starting. What looks to be a major esports league? Yeah, um, it, it is, the, it, the meta, and it's unfortunate. It's something we should definitely get around to talking about on the discussion show, right? One of the reasons why I'm not encouraged to jump in, and, and it might not be the case, is that it, you know, there's there's a community that's grown up around that that is, um, you know, uh, you know, deep dumpster dives like the lore and the fan fiction, um, and and all of, all the design elements of the game, and so. I feel like for me to jump in and play um, and into a game where there's probably nobody talking in the public channel, right? It feels like if, if I'm going to play a game and feel lonely, I may as well just continue to play the first person mode, right? So, so yeah, I, I, that's just that's just been my my walk away from it. Well, right? I, I, I kind of understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that 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 could be an interesting. Is it for for me? That I almost feel that way a little bit with Destiny, to be honest with you. So, um, what are we at? Twenty nine minutes, thirty minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if you were, we might to actually see. hit our target today. Yeah, yeah, yep. We did good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thanks so much for joining into this episode of E2KG in thirty. We are getting you out in uh, just a tad over 30 minutes and we may even wrap this up uh, before the clock flips to the uh, minute 31. So thanks again for joining in. Please go back and check out uh, episodes of uh, Enough to Keep Going. Also check out our uh, one entertainment podcast that we have right now, The Dark Hypotheses, which is a dark matter fan cast. Uh, it's pretty popular. Um, people seem to be warming up to it. Uh, there has been an absolute tirade going on on Twitter uh, since we uh, finished recording last night. Um, of likes and retweets of uh, of the um, of the Twitter post um, uh, uh, announcing the show, and uh, it's it's gotten much faster uptake than uh, previous episodes. It is 
not yet hit the number of our most viewed episode, which was uh, episode seven, um, for which I have no idea why that was the most viewed episode. Um, but uh, but eight looks to also be uh, catching people's interest, so please go check that out. Um, I think that's going to do it for us. I don't really have anything else to plug. So uh, once more, my name has been a guest, Clint Stamos from Heroes.com, here with uh, Swiss Guard. Uh, thanks so much for joining in. We will see you next week. I said I like what I